Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to High Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, we're continuing our study on the Road to Calvary series. This is book three, entitled Be Filled Now. This is part five, which is entitled The Holy Spirit, the Comforter. Now, having seen the Holy Spirit as the convictor of those who sin, we now need to see him as the comforter of those who repent. The moment the Spirit succeeds in breaking us in repentance, the whole direction of his ministry seems to change. It is directed wholly to comforting the now contrite one and encouraging him to find everything in Christ. To a people who had received of the Lord's hand double for all their sins, which is discussed in Isaiah chapter 40 verse 1, the message was of old, Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith our God. And so it is today. If the translators use the word comforter, it is because the Greek word bears that meaning as much as advocate. And those who know the Holy Spirit's work in their hearts know how worthily he bears that name. He who is so relentless and disconcerting in his conviction of sin is wonderfully sweet in the comfort that he gives the one who mourns for sin and laments his poverty. Blessed are those that mourn, said Jesus, for they shall be comforted. And it is the Holy Spirit who applies that comfort. He does so by taking the things of Christ and showing them unto us. We see this in John chapter 16, verse 14. This simply means that to the repentant heart he witnesses of Christ and of the sufficiency of his precious blood for his peace and right standing with God. He then bids him believe in him afresh and rejoice. He reveals that the sins which we confess were anticipated and settled by the Lord Jesus on the cross before they were even committed. That provision has been made ahead of time for the very poverty in which we find ourselves. He witnesses of a risen Savior showing us that God has set the seal of his infinite satisfaction upon the atoning work of our Lord by raising him again from the dead, and that if God is satisfied with his work on our behalf, we may be too. He witnesses to the struggling saint hoping for improvement in the flesh, that the man who commits these sins, that would be the old man that is mentioned in Romans chapter 6, that man is judicially crucified with Christ, meaning that his sin has ended, not been mended. He may therefore cease to be disappointed in a man whom God has brought to an end in the cross and may turn wholly to Christ who is made to him all he needs. And as the Spirit thus witnesses to him, he is enabled to believe the blessed record, and he is free in spirit, rejoicing with joy, and full of glory for such a wonderful salvation. I know not how the Spirit moves, convincing men of sin, revealing Jesus in his word, creating faith in him. You see, we may not know how he does it, sometimes through the word of Scripture, or through another's testimony, or the line of a hymn, or in more direct and inexplicable ways. But we may certainly know he does it, for this is his great work in the church. We seem to appreciate most intensely the Spirit's ministry as comforter, when, having become cold and out of touch with God, we try to get back to him by works. How natural it is for us to imagine that if we have got away from him by committing sin or doing works, by not committing sin and doing good works. And so we promise ourselves we will try harder. We set ourselves higher goals. We seek to do more for God or even to spend longer on our devotions. All these things are right, of course, 
But inasmuch as we so often do not attain those goals, we only end by burdening ourselves with additional self-reproach and an added sense of failure. We become tense in our efforts to improve and condemned because we cannot succeed. We have come to experience what Paul did when he said, the commandment which was ordained to life, if I could attain to it, I found to be unto death because I failed to do so. And if we go further along this road, we shall be in the same place of despair that he came to when he also said, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? You'll find these in Romans chapter 7, verse 10 and 24. What a relief it is when the Holy Spirit points us, as he did Paul, away from our work to another's work, the finished work of Christ for us on the cross, whereby we see that the work has been done for us. The distance between us and God has been bridged and peace has come. The Spirit bids us cease from trying to get peace by our own efforts and to come to Jesus as a sinner and rest in what he has done. As we do so, the burden of striving and self-reproach slips away from our hearts, and the Comforter then whispers peace to our hearts. Nothing either, great or small, nothing sinner no. Jesus did it, did it all, long long ago. Till to Jesus work you clean by a simple faith. Doing is a deadly thing. Doing ends in death. Cast your deadly doing down, down at Jesus' feet. Stand in him, in him alone, gloriously complete. One of the best illustrations of the Spirit's testimony to the finished work of Jesus is that of the dove returning to Noah in the ark. We're told in Genesis chapter 8, verse 11, And lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off, in order that Noah would know the waters were abated from off the earth. The testimony that the dove brought back was the olive leaf in its mouth. As Noah saw it, he knew that there was one spot on the earth from which the waters had passed. There was one bit that was clear of judgment. And this was a message of peace to those in the ark. Today, the Holy Spirit brings the testimony that there is one person who is clear of judgment. He was once under it, absolutely so, but he has come out of it in resurrection power, hallelujah. But the judgment of which he is now clear is our judgment. Therefore, if our surety is clear of it, we for whom he stood as surety are clear of it as well. This is what is meant when it says in Romans 4.25, He who was delivered for our offenses was raised again for our justification. If we want to see the dove with the olive leaf in her mouth, read through the Acts of the Apostles. All the time we see the Holy Spirit is bearing witness to a risen Christ. In chapter 2, verse 24, it says, Whom God hath raised up. In verse 32 of that same chapter, This Jesus hath God raised up. Chapter 3, verse 15, Whom God hath raised from the dead. Chapter 10, verse 40, Him God raised up the third day. Over and over again, the Spirit presents the blessed fact that Jesus is clear of the judgment that he was once under. This means that in God's sight and reckoning, we are as clear of the condemnation and reproach, even self-reproach, of sin that he, Jesus, is. He has been under it. The waves and billows have gone over him. But he is beyond it forever now, and that for our justification. The Spirit now witnesses with our spirit that we are as clear of it all as He is. This is the solid comfort which the Holy Spirit brings to the despairing soul that has learned to repent. If we take that in our hearts, we shall obtain a true sense of the love of God as never before. This is the first wave of the Spirit's power 
in our souls. The first effect of his indwelling to shed the love of God abroad in our hearts, as we are told in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, and thus to provoke our love for him in return. Now let us not forget, the Holy Spirit only convicts in order to comfort. It will help us to distinguish his voice from that of the devil. The devil is called the accuser of the brethren. And his accusations to the sensitive conscience are sometimes confused with the convictions of the Holy Spirit. But his accusations never have any comfort in view. They are simply nagging, which only leads to despair and bondage. Allow me to read that again. The devil is called the accuser of the brethren, and his accusations to the sensitive conscience are sometimes confused with the convictions of the Holy Spirit. But his accusations never have any comfort in view. They are simply nagging, which only leads to despair and bondage. Even as you assent to them, you instinctively know that there is never going to be any end to them. He always leads the soul back to Sinai, to the law to the standards we have not yet attained, and thus to despair. The Holy Spirit's convictions, however, are sharp and short, and we know instinctively that if we would bow to them and say yes, there is nothing but peace for our souls. If the devil leads us to Sinai, the Holy Spirit always leads us to Calvary. He is ever the sweet messenger of the new covenant of peace for sinners. The Holy Spirit's comfort, however, does not only deal with the answer of Christ for our sin, but with his whole resources for our every other conceivable need. Jesus said, He shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. If the government of our affairs is on our own shoulders, Our one concern is that we shall have power adequate for our responsibilities. But if the government is on his shoulders, then the only one who needs to have the power is he. And that is the Spirit's delight to show us that it is he, Jesus, who has the government upon his shoulders. He reveals him to our hearts, not merely as the one who can overcome the devil, but who has done so already through his cross. He shows him to us seated in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power. Hallelujah. And we are told this in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20 through 21. He is supreme over every opposing force, and ourselves, we are identified with him there. This means that we are not merely on the winning side, but on the side that has already won. Hallelujah. We do not fight for victory, but we fight from it. Until we have some such revelation of the Lord Jesus in our problems, we are tense, worried, and striving, and things are on top of us. But when, in our hour of need, the Spirit shows us Jesus and the resources that are His, we are free. We see ourselves in Him as the head and not the tail. And defeat is banished in the basic realm from which it needs to be banished, the realm of our spirit. Being victorious in spirit, we become victorious in the other spheres too. For faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Praise Jesus. This can be found in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. And as we go forward with a new boldness and confidence, we find God working for us in and through our situation. The story is told of how Spurgeon was once burdened and worried about his problems and responsibilities. Suddenly, as he was riding in his carriage, He kicked his legs in the air and laughed aloud. He says that what brought joy and release to his heart 
was seeing himself like a fish worrying as to whether there was water enough for it to swim in when all the time it was swimming in the Atlantic Ocean. And such he saw the grace of his Lord to be for all of his needs. There in that carriage, the mighty advocate of the Lord Jesus exercised his ministry as comforter on behalf of a needy servant of God. This brings us to the whole question of the power of the Holy Spirit for service, for which some of us so ardently long. Here I can only give my own experience. I find that the Holy Spirit endues with power from on high, not by fixing my eyes on that power so that I fervently pray for it, but rather on the Lord Jesus risen from the dead and showing me the power and position which belong to him. As I see that, I lose my burdens, fears, and striving. I find myself made strong in faith again and endued with the needed heavenly power for the service at hand. Elisha received the double portion of the spirit which rested on Elijah only when he saw his master ascend into heaven. Then the mantle, the symbol of that power, fluttered down to his feet. Only as we allow the Holy Spirit to show us again the adequacy of the Lord Jesus and believingly receive his revelation, will we find ourselves robed with power from on high and going forth with boldness to see God working with us. Sometimes in an evangelistic campaign in which I am involved, some Christians have said to me, is it not strange how on a certain day the break came after which the whole campaign took a new turn? It was not strange to me, you see. I knew what happened to a burdened and tensed evangelist on the day in question alone in his bedroom, or rather, what he was given to see. He saw Jesus crowned with glory and honor, with all things under his feet. The waves he thought were over his head, he saw to be under his feet. So often we are praying for supply when what the Spirit wants to give us is sight, sight of Jesus, Jesus crowned and victorious, hallelujah. Now it may be asked at this point, how do we get this new sight of Jesus and when do we need it? Well, the answer is actually quite simple. It's not by trying to get it, or even praying for it, but rather it's by telling God that we have not got it. Let us not dissipate our energies for the time being anywhere else but in this one direction. Tell the Father that you are not seeing Jesus. Tell him that you are in bad shape and that you are not free and that you do not have peace. Tell him you are struggling to get by on your own efforts but left upon your own, you were struggling nonetheless. Tell him that today you have not this sight of Jesus, his blood and his victory that you had yesterday. Make no effort to get it, friends. Just tell him you do not have it. Then allow him to show you why you do not have it. He may show you dark and unsuspected things, but say yes to him. All this is what is meant by going to the feet of Jesus, to the foot of his cross. Such phrases may sound like cliches to some, but they express an awesome and hallowed experience to others. It is only there that the blood of Jesus avails for you, and you will not have been long at his feet before the Holy Spirit arises with healing in his wings and gives you to see all you need to see of Jesus, and to possess all you need to possess of his fullness. And that brings us to an end of part five today, friends. But I want to go back and read one portion that really spoke to me and inspired me, and I trust it will you as well. The author says, let us not forget then that the Holy Spirit only convicts in order to comfort. It will help us to distinguish his voice from that of the devil. The devil is called the accuser of the brethren, and his accusations to the sensitive conscience are sometimes confused with the convictions of the Holy Spirit. But his accusations never have any comfort in view. They are simply nagging, 
which only leads to despair and bondage. And even as you assent to them, you instinctively know that there is never going to be any end to them. Just a constant nagging, a constant dripping from a faucet. This condemnation always leads us back to Sinai, back to the law, to the standards that we have not yet attained and maybe cannot attain. The Holy Spirit's convictions, however, are short and sharp. And we know instinctively that if we would bow to them and say, yes, there is nothing but peace for our souls. May the Lord God Almighty today give us the wisdom to understand this, the patience to endure, the mind to distinguish the difference, and the transparency to take all before him, holding nothing back, allowing our hearts, souls, and minds to be filled with the comforting presence of his holy, holy, sweet spirit. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you. I'll see you on the next video.